um, call the meeting to order. Um, this will be the last chapter meeting of 2023. Uh, so I'm, we're still looking for speakers for 2024. So if anyone is interested, please contact me or Gail. Um, as you see, there's a poll up and I'll give the results uh, right before we segue to Abby Ince, who's giving our presentation <laughs> tonight. Um, but Alicia is our vice president and she has sent out a um, a survey. And uh, Alicia, you want to talk about that? Sure. Thanks, Mike. Hey, everybody. Good evening. If you're in the Pines and Prairies chapter, we are happy to have all of our friends from the Houston and Texas region. But for all my Pines and Prairies folks, I've dropped a link in the chat. It's in the, It should take you about a minute, maybe two. You would fill that out. Mike and I are trying to put together a calendar, but we don't want to plan stuff that you don't want to go to. So we need your input. So please take a minute or two. Drop your details in the chat right there. We'd appreciate in the just click on the link. That's OK, Sherry. We're looking for folks that are right here in the Pines and Prairies area. If you'd let us know what you want to do, that would be appreciated. Thank you all. Any questions on that before I throw it back to Mike? Negative. Perfect. All right, Mike. Okay, so I will keep the poll open. Is it is it on people's screen? If it is, I'm going to close it in a minute because I don't want to take away from your ability to see um, Abby's uh, presentation. I think is I assume it's on your screen. I might, how about now? Still on your screen? No. Yes. Mike, it only yeah. shows up on our screen when we haven't taken the poll. So once oh, we click okay. the right button, it goes away. Okay. So then it's not in your way. So I'll keep it up, but uh, I'll just report on that because I think it's, to me, it was interesting. So, so far, so far, we've got 29 people have taken it. So there are 13 people uh, from Pines and Prairies, one from Houston, two from Clear Lake, um, and nine from other Nipsot chapters. We've got five from Hartwood, Texas Master Naturalist, and 12 that are Texas Master Naturalist from other chapters. And I would guess many of them are also Nipsot chapter members from um, around the state. So that's at least my guess. Okay, so much for the polling. Um, I mentioned earlier, Gail McConnell cannot be here tonight. She's on a plane due to a problem with her earlier flight. And so um, we do have uh, a really good speaker tonight, Abby Ince. And uh, she is uh, a BS in microbiology and a BS in wildlife biology and wildlife and fisheries from Texas A&M. She has an M MS from wildlife biology from Texas Tech University. And she's the founder of Living Wild, which is a design services firm focusing on creating natural habitats in yards, properties, and parks. She's a member of the Hartwood chapter of the Texas Master Naturalist and uh, Pines and Prairies chapter member. So it's great to have one of our chapter members presenting and uh, a very interesting and energetic gal. So I'm sure we're in for a great presentation. So with that, take it away, Abby. Thanks, Mike. That was a great inter intro. Um, hi, everybody. I am Abby, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about um, how native plants are impacting our ecosystems and our wildlife. And I'm going to be focusing on urban um, ecosystems because that's where most of us live. Even though I have a couple examples that are not urban, they're still pretty important to the whole story of everything. Um, so with that, um, this is a little bit about me. Sorry, I have to do a click. Um, I did my master's on alligators and my focus was actually herpetology. And so I, I love snakes, I love lizards, I love all things that creep and crawl. Um, 
we do. This is me and my husband. He helps me with my business quite a bit. Um, of course, we have our dogs and we have uh, the Hendrickson Homestead, which is where we live. We have 15 acres that we are trying to restore for wildlife diversity. Um, and it's been a, a journey <laughs> to say the least so far. Um, but, you know, we see all sorts of different native plants that come up, some not so native, but the native plants are really helping our wildlife. And that's really what we're exploring tonight. Um, this is a little bit about my company. It's Living Wild. And down here are some examples of the gardens that we've created for different people. Um, this is Kat. She is uh, one of my employees and currently a student at St Sam Houston University. Mm -hmm. And that's Calandra. Um, she does a lot of our design work and she has her degree in plant and soil sciences from Sam Houston. Um, and again, I can't I can't talk about my business without talk, mentioning my husband because he um, really helps me out with taxes and stuff. Much more than that, but taxes. Um, so I want to tell you guys first a story um, about how wolves change rivers. And if you're into ecology, you've probably heard this story before. Um, but it's it's an interesting one, and it's going to kind of foreshadow our overarching theme tonight. Um, so. In 1926, the uh, wolves were completely eliminated from Yellowstone National Park, and the park had the entire ecosystem actually change. And so what happened when they took away the wolves as the top predator, um, the elk were left unchecked. And so they started uh, going down the riverbanks and eating all the baby elders and the baby aspens. And that typically is what um, beavers will eat. And um, beavers, we know, are landscape engineers. So without the wolves, there was no pressure on the elk and they ate all of the beaver's food. The beavers were of course left out of the ecosystem having no food and they died off. Um, that changed the waterways. It stopped the marshes being formed because we know beavers make dams. Um, <clears throat> and then we can kind of see over here, there's a lot more animals whenever the wolves have returned. Um, I think they started in the 80s and 90s trying to return them to Yellowstone National Park. And as the wolves took hold in Yellowstone, it start, they started to see this change in the landscape in where the elk had pressure from the wolves, so they couldn't stand around and eat all their favorite stuff. They had to move along to keep the wolves from eating them. So with that movement through the landscape, they didn't take away all of the beavers' food. The beavers eventually came back, redammed the rivers, and made marshes, uh, bogs, and different ecosystems within the Yellowstone uh, greater ecosystem. So that is kind of one of the quintessential ecology stories is what what do we do without uh, big predators? And so I want to talk about healthy ecosystems. Um, healthy ecosystems have complete uh, food webs. Um, you're probably familiar with food, food webs from the producers up to the consumers and um, starting with the plants and then going to the grazers and the predators. Um, this, I, this is a, a stick of mine, but it doesn't include your house cats. If you have house cats, they, um, and they're free ranging or feral cats, they do uh, contribute to the largest take in wildlife every year um, because they are such efficient hunters. Um, we also have that the healthy ecosystem is supported by a, a biodiversity. And I'd like to talk a little bit about biodiversity in a minute. Um, these graphs are on here just to kind of remind us that populations have natural checking points. So this carrying capacity here is everything that the ecosystem can support. This line is where if it goes above it, the ecosystem's no longer supporting that. And so it's going to dip down. This is a, a predator and prey interaction model. And it shows that this is rabbits and wolves. So we both start out at 100. And as the rabbits are eaten, the wolves go down in population because the rabbits are going down in population. Um, that has a reciprocal effect. 
and the rabbits will jump up in population and the wolves will soon follow suit in generations. And so that is what ecosystems look like on a large time scale. Um, a little bit more about biodiversity. It's the number of species that we find in a specific space and area of time. And so the biodiversity of this first picture over here, um, I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different species of wildflower. And we're gonna see through tonight how the different species actually um, support our native wildlife and more of it. We also have, um, we're, we're in the Piney Woods ecoregion, some of us are, and we have pines. These are pine, this is a pine plantation. I only see one species here. Um, that's a monoculture. And monocultures are extremely susceptible to diseases. So for example, if we had a pine boring beetle come through, there's a pine tree next to a pine tree next to a pine tree. They can easily jump to those pine trees and spread throughout the entire forest. Perhaps let's say we had a pine tree next to a pine tree next to a dogwood next to an oak next to a pine tree. That's more species diversity within that small area. And it's also putting up almost a barrier for the pests so that they can't just take over and run rampant unchecked. Um, this is a, just a good picture of a forest that has a lot of different habitats, a lot of different microclimates going on. Um, in the in the East Texas Piney Woods, we used to have uh, black bears. We don't anymore, but we used to. Um, and in this picture, I can see quite a few different species of plants that are able to support the life that's around them. So we care about biodiversity for many reasons, and it was kind of hard to fit it all on one slide, and I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Um, it is every it produces everything that we rely on as humans, our clean air, many modern medicines, our clean water, um, green spaces. It, it is so fundamental to our lives that the ecosystem services that the biodiversity that we have provide are estimated to be about double the world's GDP. Um, and, and that's hard to, it's hard to uh, estimate, but we can't really show on what scale the trees are cleaning our air or the ocean is taking in carbon. Um, and so biodiversity allows all these things to happen. It's the relationships between an different animals. And the single best thing that you can do to increase biodiversity in your urban or suburban habitats um, is plant native plants, of course. And I love this picture because it shows um, our root stabilization of the native plants. So we have the spirea, the daylilies, the non-natives, and their roots don't go more than three feet, maybe. Um, then we come over here to the native plants and we look down at this guy, common nine bark. He's down here at 15 feet with his root depth. The amount of carbon sequestering and the amount of soil stabilization that's going on with that controls erosion, controls an entire ecosystem from running away. So our native plants are actually not, they're not only cleaning our water, cleaning our air, doing everything that we think of, but they are sequestering the carbon and putting it down underneath um, the soil for us. So they're, they're really doing double, triple duty. Um, this was an interesting study that just, one of them just kind of proves the point that native landscaping um, in urban and residential communities supports a wider variety of birds and it actually supports their natural foraging abilities. And so that's basically what this says. Um, that's it supported greater numbers of feeding birds with individuals, um, especially with trees like oak and native trees, the, they noticed that with more tr native trees in the backyard, they had a wider diversity of uh, birds. So I've picked a couple of the birds that we have around here. Um, if I was in person, I'd be asking you guys to name these out and shout them out. Uh, but this is a cardinal on a possum hall holly. 
Uh, this is a baby bluebird on a pokeweed, which is native, of course. Um, and this is a downy woodpecker that's foraging on a lichen on a tree, which we have lots of down here in the Houston area. Um, so this is just, you know, some of the uh, plants that they that our birds will use. Pokeweed is actually quite toxic to uh, mammals, but it makes a great dye. Um, you can see it's very, very purple. It makes this fuchsia dye. Um, but birds love it, and a lot of people consider it a weed. But if you have it growing in your garden, you're bound and determined to have uh, birds. Um, another study that I thought was really interesting was a diversity study between these two plant species that you see on the screen. Uh, this one on the left-hand side is going to be our Russian sage. Um, and on our right-hand side, we have our beautiful native blanket flower. And so the point of this entire study basically was the Russian sage attracted the most insect visitors, but the key was they were mostly honeybees. So maybe they had 100 to 150 honeybees visit this Russian sage. We look at the uh, native blanket flower and it attracted 12 different species of bees three different species of butterflies and two fly species across the sampling data. Um, and so when we look at these plants, we're saying, okay, yeah, that Russian sage is covered in European honeybees. That makes sense. It's not from here and the European honeybees are all over it. Um, and then we look at our natives and we see a wider, wider range of diversity that it's supporting on this one flower. <clears throat> this is a couple of my favorite plants. Um, and I went through um, a lot of literature to find out how many, uh, roughly, how many species will utilize these different plants. And so elderberry is one of our native plants that we have. It grows along the wet, marshy areas. It can do full sun, but it kind of likes the shaded, uh, more forested areas. And a total of 78 different species can utilize elderberry for food resources. I just did food resources. Um, I had to stop over 300 species, otherwise I would never stop counting. Um, but 78 species will use elderberry and it's mostly because of the flowers and the berries. So if you see flowers and berries out, you can. it's kind of a tip off that it's a perfect wildlife plant. You might also see frog fruit around. It's a low-lying ground cover, and it's a host plant to these three butterflies, the Texas Phaon crescent, the white peacock, and the common buckeye. Um, it's frost tolerant. It's semi-evergreen, and it has these cute little flowers, and so I often use it for lawn replacement. The amount of different species that use frog fruit is 18. We have little blue stem grass. We can see that there's a lot of different skippers that use blue stems as their host. Whenever I see that a grass hosts uh, skippers or little uh, hair streaks maybe, I tend to think of that's free bird food that's happening right there um, and encouraging the birds to forage naturally or, or encouraging the wildlife to forage naturally. Um, so 39 species can utilize the blue, little blue stem as either uh, food and graze and their seeds for granivorous uh, birds. The gay feather supports 64 species. It's one of my favorite plants. Um, it is usually covered in butterflies and that is listed as a special value to native bees, native butterflies, and if you can see this little pink friend down here, that is the glorious flower moth. Um, pretty bird food, if you will. These are some of the birds that are most commonly attracted to blazing stars so if, or gay feather. So if you like uh, your birds, I would put this in your garden. I wanna kind of talk about invasive plants uh, throughout here. Um, one I want to focus on is the Chinese tallow. And if you live in the woodlands or the Houston area, you see this everywhere. Um, it's a fast growing fire resistant tree that gets uh, eaten by a lot of the birds who consume our native seeds. 
So when we look at a bird like the goldfinch, who's usually eating the sweet gum trees or the grass seeds and the coneflower seeds, and they would be normally dispersing those seeds throughout our environment, if their time and their energy is used on collecting Chinese tallow seeds and they're dispersing them all over our ecosystem, it's detracting from the native species as a as a seed competition, essentially. Um, so when we have Chinese tallows take over an area, they will literally suck riverbeds dry because they can use up so much water. So we, and it's very hard to kill them, they're fire resistant. And so this is why invasive plants, you know, it's not just, oh, there's there's a plant, let's cut it down. It's how it's actually affecting the eco region to the point of altering a habitat, altering a river system. Another example is uh, more central Western Texas is affecting lizard abundance and native plants. So this study was done um, to look at and see how native cottonwood trees and invasive salt cedar trees played a role in these two species of lizards. And what they found was when they took out the invasive salt cedar tree, the lizards increased in abundance. And it was more of a park, green space, open space with these big cottonwood trees interspersed between them instead of this choking vegetation from the salt cedar. And when they took it out, the these two lizards actually recolonized those areas and avoided areas of invasive salt cedar. So it, it's just a, one more little um, nail in the coffin for our, our native plants and our native uh, wildlife if we let our invasive species take over. Um, our native plants have evolved, co-evolved with our native wildlife. And my favorite example of this is the native plant cardinal flower. And they are specifically uh, evolved to attract hummingbirds. And it, it uh, many flowers will do this, but you can see right here, the hummingbird is going into the flower. That's the stamen and the pollen at the top. When it reaches into the flower, the stamen and the pollen boop it on the back of the head. And it goes from cardinal flower to cardinal flower to cardinal flower because they're all blooming at the same time. And it ensures that the cardinal flower is getting its pollen from that exact spot on that hummingbird so that it's only, it doesn't have to compete with all of the other hummingbird, uh, with, I'm sorry, with all of the other nectar and pollen that gets on the hummingbird's face from the different flowers. It's right back here on the hummingbird's head. I think that is one of the coolest uh, examples of our co-evolution with nature. Um, we have a couple more of our native plant species. We have the inland sea oats. It's one of my favorite grasses because you can actually attract fireflies with it. Um, if you didn't know, Montgomery County, Texas should have 28 species of fireflies. Um, and the greater and Texas state has 400 and 30 some odd uh, species of fireflies. So we should have them here. One of the big reasons we don't is because of uh, mosquito spraying systems and pesticides. Um, this, again, this inland sea oats is one of the only grasses that grows rapidly and lush in shade. And we have a lot of that in, in the forested canopy or in the, in the forest from the canopy. Um, it does host the pepper and salt, which I think is odd that they put it that way, but pepper and salt skipper butterfly um, and a couple other guys. But overall, there are 208 species that will utilize inland sea oats. Um, this is a dogwood. We have these interspersed occasionally throughout our forest forests. It's famous for its spring blooms. It's beautiful in the spring, it turns all white and it looks like it's kind of snowing in the forest. Um, it's a special value to insects for its nectar and it's also a special value for uh, birds and its fruit. So a total of 84 species will use dogwood, um, which is 
quite a bit. And if you think about having this one species in your backyard, you're supporting 84 new species that can come and visit you. And that's making for a very healthy ecosystem. This next one is Joe Pieweed, and it's it's really hard to find in nurseries. Uh, it grows in shaded damp conditions, which again, we have a lot of, but it's one of the best pollinator plants that you can have in your pollinator garden if it's in shade. Um, these are just a few of the things that use them down here. I couldn't name everything. Joe Pieweed is an excellent addition. I know it says it there, but I can't overstate it. It's an excellent addition. Um, over 300 species use Joe Pie weed, which is incredible. Um, we have lots of bees, lots of bee flies. Um, the monarchs and our butterflies will all use Joe Pie weed. So Joe Pie weed is, is one of the must haves for a shade pollinator garden. I want to talk a little bit about when we trim for wildlife and that these are our native plants, our native bog cone flowers. They like it kind of moist, um, really sunny, and they give these big, tall uh, flower spikes. Um, and if you cut them about six inches above the root base, you leave out the stems that you can kind of see here, right there. Um, and then bees will come, our native carpenter bees, our native um, <laughs> sweet bees will come and burrow out and dig the hole into the hollow stem. And that is where a lot of our solitary native bees overwinter. So these are very important for uh, us to cut at the correct height. Um, you can see this little bee doing his carpentry job. And then if you see your plants that look like they're been eaten from the inside out and there's all these wood shavings, you're providing habitat for bees. So what do I do with all the clippings is a common question that I get. And I like to make bird teepees. So basically lashing all of your cuttings together. These are the bog cone flowers. Um, but you lash all your cuttings together as and then the uh, goldfinches, the seed eaters in the wintertime, our migratory seed eaters, will come and pick off all of the seeds and hang from the cones. And it's really beautiful. I do want to talk about uh, OE as a parasite that monarchs get. And on the right is our native swamp milkweed. And on the left is our non-native Mexican milkweed or tropical milkweed. And the difference between them is, is a matter of nectar and a matter of uh, hosting the OE parasite. So the main, the main difference between the two is the swamp milkweed will die back after it has uh, bloomed, done its thing, and the winter comes. It will die back uh, to the ground almost completely. When winter comes, the tropical milkweed does not die down and it continues to bloom. So that's the first thing that throws the monarchs off their migratory route is we have all this Mexican milkweed up in Texas that's blooming and they think, oh, we've made it to our migratory destination. We can stop and breed. And when that happens, a big freeze comes through and knocks down the monarch population because they stopped too early. So it, it's best to plant our native milkweeds, um, just for the temporal consideration and the timing consideration um, of the bloom. But then there's also the added problem of OE. And OE is a parasite that monarchs get. It's a amoeba parasite. And it makes your monarchs deformed. They don't really make it out of chrysalis. Um, and if they do, their uh, wings are, are quite deformed. Um, when the OE parasite is on the monarch, uh, it kind of sheds spores onto milkweeds and it can live within the milkweed over the winter if the milkweed doesn't die down. And so typically, our native milkweeds that are dying down don't support the OE parasite, but because 
our tropical milkweeds that have gotten so common in the nursery trade do support OE um, as they do not die down. It's created a, a pretty catastrophic event across the, uh, across the monarch population. And it's just going to get um, worse unless we start cutting down the tropical milkweed at the end of its bloom time to tell the, the monarchs it's time to move on, you can't stay here, um, and to get rid of high levels of OE parasite in the, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I've had a cold, in the tropical milkweed. You can't see the parasites with your nor with your naked eye. Um, these are butterfly scales that were taken. You know, if you ever touch a butterfly and they have scales on their wings, they'll come off on your fingers. These are the scales underneath the microscope. And these itty bitty little dots are the OE parasite spores. Um, this is a, quite a heavy infection. Um, so that's, that is interesting to say the least about our monarchs and planting our natives. Um, does anybody have any questions? Wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. You don't see any in the chat. It's okay, we'll wait. Uh, Miss Melissa, here we go. Miss Melissa Rothiker says, what was the coneflower, swamp coneflower? It was a bog or giant coneflower, bog or giant. Um, Miss Lisa Massey would like to know if we can restate the names of the native milkweeds that are a better option than tropical. Absolutely. Um, there is going to be swamp milkweed, which is this pink guy over here. Um, there is going to be world, W-H-O-R-L-E-D, uh, world milkweed. Um, there is going to be Texas milkweed, Asclepius texana. Green or antelope horn milkweed. That's more Western-ish, but they, they grow here. Um, aquatic milkweed grows here very well. <laughs> Mike, am I missing any of the milkweeds? Uh, did, you uh, did you min mention Perennis? No. Which one's that? Um, Perennis is aquatic, Abby. Okay. Oh, it's aquatic. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we listed aquatic. So swamp aquatic, those are different. Swamp is different than aquatic. Um, world, Texas, green. Tuberosa. Tuberosa, that's the butterfly weed. Asclepius tuberosa. Thank you, Carol. Um, Miss Alicia Main Johnson would like to know, besides Joe Pie weed, what's your favorite native? My favorite native. <laughs> well, for sun, it's probably going to be one of those bog cone flowers. So many things use the bog cone flower um, that it's just one of those incredible plants that you can count on to attract a lot of different species to your garden. Um, and if I was saying shade native plant would probably be a Gulf Coast penstemon. Uh, hummingbirds love those guys and they're kind of this meadowy airy look whenever you plant them in mass together and they all bloom. Um, Miss Melissa needs the botanical name. Think of the swamp or the bog cone flower is Rudbeckia maxima. It's also a giant cone flower. Um, Hey, Abby, Denise, I'd give a, give a warning on that giant coneflower. When you get one, you then have 1,000. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They spread and have babies like crazy. So all your friends and neighbors will also have giant coneflower. Yes. Yes. Um, 
Denise Frank would like to know if Joe Pieweed is native to Texas. It is. I don't know the species name off the top of my head. Carol might. Carol? Maybe? Yeah, I'll type it into the chat. Perfect. Um, David Gwynn said red, re red wing milkweed. Uh, I have not heard of that one. I've not heard of that one. Um, Miss Melissa said the perineus is easy to propagate. She's talking about the aquatic milkweed is the easiest to propagate. Um, Lisa says, thanks so much. It's hard to, and Amy says, it's so hard to explain why planting natives is important to the gardeners, but when they see bees and butterflies on their exotic plants, that is difficult. Um, I always like to tell my clients and tell everybody that I talk to that even though they're utilizing it, it doesn't mean it's good for them. And so I, I take crepe myrtles, for example. I lovingly call them crap myrtles um, because <laughs> their nectar is not great. Um, it's equivalent to a McDonald's fast food type dinner, right? And then we can look at our natives as like the big Thanksgiving meal that has the robust nutrition in it. And we can see even across cultivars of natives. So we take like Texas lantana, um, our, our true native lantana, that has hundreds of cultivars of the new gold and all the different colors and all that. There is uh, research showing that now the nectar quality on those cultivars is much lower than on the original um, the original species because they've been those flowers have been selected for color, not for nectar nutritious quality, which is what the wildlife is selecting for. And so it's kind of is it's kind of a hard one to explain to people, but um, you know we we want the wildlife to have the ability to make the best choices and have the best nectar for them. <laughs> Um, any other questions? Where do I source my plants? Um, from Miss Alicia, where do I source my plants? So I get a lot of my plants from native Texas and I get a lot of my plants from native, uh, native growers that even can supply to the native plant society like Carol, um, she does. Um, and so the native plant society and I do a lot of things. Um, I I rely on them to kind of keep everybody on the native train, you know. Um, but it's mainly native Texas out of Austin, um, Magnolia Gardens, and Miss Carol, and Martin Martin Simpson. Uh, Carol said, "Hollow Joe Pieweed is you Eutrochium fistulosum." Um, David Gwynn said red wing milkweed or Asclepius variegata is a woodland native adapted species native to the piney woods and often found in shade roadsides up in the Sam Houston National Forest. How awesome. I would love to see that. What I wonder what colors, is it red? Is it, do they have red wings? I bet they do. Hmm. Interesting. White. White. Okay. Aptly named. Got it. <laughs> Ann Reynolds says, I like what Lady Bird Johnson said. I like Texas looking like Texas, not New York City. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I, I would say keep Texas wild. Denise Frank asked what native grasses can thrive in two to three hours of sun in a dry area mm. woof um two to three hours of dry sun typically grass is really like sun uh -huh. um, so i would probably steer you more towards sedges um sedges have edges so they're kind of the uh rough ones um there's Cherokee sedge, there's woodland sedge, 
There's Weberville sedge. They all have that grassy, airy look and they do well in the shade. Um, I mentioned inland sea oats earlier before. That is a true shade, shade native grass um, that's easily found at nurseries, easily found in the nursery trade. Um, Mike McGee wants to know how I determine the number of species supported by the native plants. So what I did was go through and um, I looked on Google Scholar at the published scientific papers that talked about habitat and wildlife utilization for specific native plants. There are quite a few out there, but I had to compile the lists. Um, and so what I would do is I'd go through and say, okay, these are the birds that use this plant. These are the butterflies that use this plant. And I tally them up. So those, those numbers are butter are insects, birds, and mammals. And yeah, I don't think I included reptiles. So insects, birds, and mammals are those numbers. Yeah, it was a lot of work to create those slides, but I thought it was so important for everybody to see that, you know, we can support such a robust amount of species um, by just planting one single tree in our yard. You know, we plant, choose a dogwood and you get 84 species. And it's, it's kind of a great bang for your buck. David Gwynn said, thanks. You are so welcome, David. Thanks for coming. Thank you all for coming. I hope you learned something and enjoyed it. Well, without any other questions, I really want to thank you. That was very informative and in depth. And uh, I, for one, I'm sure a lot of other people really enjoyed that. That was fantastic, Abby. Um, Thanks, Mike. I'm always happy to speak for you guys. It's always so much fun. And to find my plant people is even better. All right. Well, you'll get a re return invitation very soon. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a great night.